All right, fourth industrial revolution. You guys have heard us talk about that. Generation one, steam and water. Generation two, electricity and all the cool things it enabled. Gen three, this guy. Microelectronics, digital and information technology. Now we are moving faster than ever before and accelerating. We have artificial intelligence, natural language processing, voice recognition, computer vision, data college, storage, blockchain, go on and on and on. First, is this a real industrial revolution? Is it going to be as big as what you helped kick off? And if so, what are we going to see? Well, I believe it's going to be. I do believe it's going to be <laughs> as big as uh, what we kicked off. Well, personal computers was just a key, a key point in time. Technology evolves and makes other things possible that weren't possible before. We discover new materials. They allow us to make faster processors that can think as fast as a human, that sort of thing. And, uh, and, uh, and we've got new technologies now between the machine learning, the artificial intelligence, chips that are synapse chips and chips that are doing, uh, you know, so much of the neural networking and we've got quantum computers coming. We are just on the verge of exploding in basically how the world works for humans, how, how life is, what it's like, how it's done. Blockchain examples are, are probably the biggest thing right now hitting that are pending. Whoa, this would change life so much. The trouble is, do you change it too much? You also have to be very careful that you don't change it in ways that you regret later on. There's almost some things that I did that I regret now that, for where we got where it got us. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Wallace. Um, Tony, I'm going to come back down this way because I want to close with you with a specific blockchain question. So right. if you don't mind, I'm going to start down this way. Go for Molly, it. Molly, well, what's your thought? Is this generation, is it real? And if so, what does it look like? Um, well, I, I believe that it's real. And I believe that there are just, there's just so much we don't know. And, you know, my background isn't in tech, but I do know something about dealing with uncertainty. Mm. and how important it is to bring a curiosity and an adventurous spirit instead of fear. I think any time we operate in a fear-based way, mm. we miss a lot and, and we limit ourselves greatly. So I think it's just really important to show up with, uh, with courage and an adventurous spirit. Great, thank you. Tony, you got, you got something to say? Jump um, in, and sure. Matt, I'll come back to you. Yeah, um, so it's definitely real, I think. And if you look at like robotics and AI, mm. at some point, eventually, they will advance to a point where robotics is so cheap and reliable that almost any type of labor will be able to be done by, by those robots. Mm -hmm. And it's just not going to make sense for companies to hire humans to do that. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, well, okay, what do we do, right? Like, what are, all, what are we going to be spending our times doing? Thank you. And so I think we all have to participate in, in what this is, whatever this revolution is going to be. But I think every revolution starts with people. Yep. And I think you have to have leaders, and those will become apparent, right? And then create visions that are proactive and also you know it has to be people first like you know, you know that's, we're a, that's here a great human humans. perspective right exactly. these are enabling tools right. not replacement tools exactly that's really a great perspective matt what's your thought oh uh, i agree with both of I, I agree with everybody so far so so far there's no debate <laughs> <laughs> i think right we'll now we'll change that don't worry the the, the time has come mm. for us as a collective to decide our fate on this ship that we're all on together, mm. right? We've got the technology, we have the power, <laughs> right? We have the power, clearly. And now it's a matter, so for me, mm. personally, I wanna know, you know, deliciousness. I wanna know how do I optimize pleasure without forsaking sustainability and health? You think we can do that How with long AI? can I keep having my pleasure mm. right up until the end? So I don't have this awful, like, sag, and I'm on tubes and everything, you know, and I'm dying, right? Yeah, yeah. I want to go right up to the end, and then lights out. Th yeah. This is a guy you want to have a cocktail with at the bar after this Absolutely. session. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Matt, thank you. Tone, you're, you're deep Bitcoin. Br bring it home from a blockchain Bitcoin perspective. Sure. Well, be before I do that, I want to say I am looking forward to the tech revolution from self-driving cars to amazing innovation and renewable energy that's going to help a lot. But the word blockchain itself gets so overused. Mm. At the end of the day, outside of Bitcoin, people are using the word blockchain as just a database. It's just a database. It's not going to change all that much. Uh, Bitcoin is revolutionary. It's uh, new money that is hard, that is going to appreciate in value because it's scarce. And the best thing is it's unconfiscatable and it's permissionless value transfer. People will learn the idea of saving once again uh, because their money can't be depreciated. So uh, I think Bitcoin will go a long way in helping uh, in this technological revolution. Uh, but the concept of blockchain and everyone having their own token, 
I see that as an equivalent of charging Apple stock for Apple products, which probably didn't make sense to Apple. That's why they didn't do it. So having a utility token that fluctuates in value for your product or service doesn't make economic sense. Uh, and I, I don't see that going all that far. I think that's the dot-com bubble with all the companies that collapsed. I kind of see it that way. But uh, the innovation of Bitcoin, I find that absolutely amazing. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. So you guys know how this works by now. White hat moderator, black hat moderator. So I'm going to go into the people side of things. So as we're moving forward, I want to know your actual impression about what's more important. Is it individual influence or is it teamwork? Or is it both? I know you're doing a ton of work with women now, helping to empower them. What do you think? You know, again, I can just answer this from my experience. But my experience is, is that it's both. Because if you don't come into a situation knowing yourself and having done substantial work on yourself, I think you know, a life unexamined is a, is a very dangerous way to proceed. And I know that because I hit bottom. Um, and so I think doing that kind of work is incredibly imperative on yourself. And then I think you have to look, look past yourself. I think that that is part of a critical part of, of growth and development. And so I know that I got to the top of the mountain in terms of success and you know, fame and money and all that stuff, and it was pretty empty. Um, and so, like I said in my talk this time around, I'm still gunning for success. I'm still ambitious, but baked into it is a, is a, is a much bigger perspective and, and uh, an emphasis on community. Awesome. Waz, what do you think? So as we're moving forward. Yeah, is it individual or is it teamwork? Yes. Or is it both or neither? There you yeah. go. And the answer is yes. <laughs> All of the above. Um, the funny thing is, OK, I was. Um, a, an individual that, a, a, that's how I came up with all my great inventions, a lot of great inventions for about 10 years of my life, just magic pouring out. But really, it wouldn't have gone anywhere and affected other people and done much. It would have affected me and my happiness, and I was proud of doing it, and I could show it to others. I was very shy. It was the only thing that could bring me out of my shyness. But when we had several people that were really good and knew their stuff about marketing and business and, and um, eventually operations and building, manufacturing, testing, and uh, all the other people make a company, accountants and everything and, and clerks, that's really, you know, and especially having some adults that kind of knew what they were doing and not just our high school friends, that really is what made Apple, uh, gave it the ability to change the world. So I believe in both. I look at companies these days and I look at the recs they have for a project and they're hiring by skill sets. What subjects did you take in the university and what do you have your masters and PhDs in? And they're hiring by skill sets and the funny thing is how well a group works together is the important thing and that's based upon how well personalities get together the same as it is in a marriage. Are you hiring very similar people that talk to each other? And that might be much more important than whether they even graduated from college or not. I find a lot of companies have their, their best programmers of all, you know, are, are very individualistic. Got to have the, the heavy metal music playing on loud, loud earphones and you can't be disturbed for one second or you lose half an hour of work. And, and so that's right. a very individualistic hey. ap um, um, exercise for quite a bit of their life. And yet, Teamwork, we always say, oh, we'll put everybody together and have big discussions. And sometimes teamwork just doesn't work a lot better if you have similar people that really want to go out and play video games together, go eat pizza, go bowling together, go on a vacation, go to movies together. And that rarely happens between managers and the groups that work for them. So I think that companies need to focus more on the teamwork. <laughs> it's easy to find individual contributors a lot of different ways. Can we all do this, please? Tone, I'm going to come to you. You are on the forefront of technologies, and their basic premise is complete transparency and using the group for accountability. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so the complete transparency aspect of the blockchain ledger 
it doesn't actually work for a lot of things. Uh, again, people tend to misunderstand it a little bit. Uh, people knock Bitcoin because every single transaction is open on a public ledger. Well, because it's decentralized, it has to be open and it's there. Uh, so every single person, I can validate uh, my own Bitcoin transactions. Um, I store every single Bitcoin transaction that takes place around the world from day one on a, on a little computer at home. Uh, but that doesn't really work for like the financial sector or medical records or uh, like lots of other things. You don't want that kind of transparency. Uh, you want there to be privacy for that. Uh, so a blockchain it doesn't really work. And what people have to realize is in a blockchain, what the blockchain did is it solved an amazing problem in computers. Uh, before Bitcoin, you always sent copies of digital data. You sent a copy of an email, a copy of a picture. You couldn't send an original picture. You couldn't send your Word document. But Bitcoin, that was the innovation. You send digital data, and you actually lose it. And that's why so far, the only application, real application, has been using it as currency. And you are responsible for that currency. A prime example for you, Molly, if half or all of your money was in Bitcoin, it could not have been seized by the government. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and there, there is nothing they can do about it. And that's such a powerful thing that will allow people to build great things. Yeah. Well Thank done, <laughs> Matt, I'm going to come to you because I like what Tone was saying. When we translate this to medicine, you had some incredible stories in the green room. What do you think? Is it individual or is it team? Is it both or is it neither? Well, Waz, I like that addition, by the way. You know, when, when, when Waz was saying, you know, get, get people together, I would say get them together to eat and drink first before you do anything else. <laughs> because when you share food and you share drink with people, um, that's when you, you bear your soul a little bit, mm -hmm. right? You, you uncover yourself and you share things you might not share in, in another environment. And, you know, there's, this, there's truth to this idea of breaking bread with people. And, you know, I said earlier, you know, we have the power. We have the power to do things. Well, we have the power to help each other out, right? We have the power to improve all of our lives. You know, this old modicum of, you know, a rising tide raises all boats. So, you know, as an academic, I try to think about things, you know, the role, my role at the University of California is to promote and, and I think a lot of people don't realize this. They think my role is to teach undergrads. That's, that's not my role at all. My role is to actually produce research that businesses can use to innovate with, right? The research that costs money that, that no one's going to invest in because it takes too long to invest in it. And that's the role of the university. That, as a public university, is a trust of all of the people in California as a, as, a, as a public university of the University of California, right? Which I believe is the greatest public university on the planet, by the way. Um, I mean, we, we, we've done an amazing amount for, for the California economy. And, and, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back against the white and the black hat, and I'm going to say <laughs> that it's a false dichotomy. Mm. And I'm going to say that actually, you know, it is, as, as Waz said, you know, it's... It is the individual and it is the group. And, and the worth of the group is measured in the, the sanctity of the individuals that comprise it. Thank you. Tony, I saved you for last. Sure. We had a conversation that rocked my world. So lottery.com is one thing and fantastic in its own right. But we talked about solving world hunger and yeah. education for the masses. So tell me your perspective on this. Um, sure. So I think to answer the question directly, yes. is um, I think it starts with the individual. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we call a leader, right? And that's somebody who sets a vision and then rallies people around them to go accomplish that vision and say, there's the hill over there and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go conquer it and who's with me? Um, and so I, I, it is both, right? It, it is the individual, but it starts with the individual and then it's, it's the team self-organizes around that. And to add on to what Waz said, it's people with aligned values 
um, who, who often do the best and people who align incentives. And so for us, we uh, at Lottery, one of our core values is we win together. And so not just internally as a team, but externally. Anybody that might have a stake in anything we're doing, whether that's you know, a government or another company, whatever it is, we want to make sure that we're all aligned together. It, it's not a zero-sum game, right. right? You don't have to lose for me to win. Absolutely. So one of the, one of the projects that we're working on is uh, we're doing a giant raffle, global raffle, uh, and that's going to benefit a very well-known NGO. And they are tasked with ending extreme hunger in the world. Mm. So they raise about $7 billion a year on their own. Uh, they're very efficient, actually. They, they're about 94% efficiency. So 94 cents of every dollar Incredible. goes to feeding That's people. Oh. So they raise seven billion a year on their own, they need 10. So when we started talking to them, we thought, okay, what can we do with that? Um, and we decided we're gonna do a giant raffle that we're gonna sell tickets all over the world. Uh, there'll be a billion dollar um, you know, jackpot, grand prize. Um, and then we're gonna donate three billion to this NGO. You know, the, the, and the more we talked about it, they said, you know, I don't think you guys understand. Like if, if we can do that, if we can pull that off, um, for the first time in all of human history, there will be no hungry people on the planet. Well, uh, it's just not. Thank you. How incredible of a thought is that? Thank you. Technology can actually enable cool. ending hunger. Yeah, you know, it's three billion dollars seems like a big number, but it's really not with yeah. all the trillions, right, that that are, are around the globe. Absolutely. Um, you know, and then obviously, like education, it's just a passion of mine. I barely graduated high school, no college, nothing like that. Um, but I do believe uh, AI, and like I think the, the best use, the most noble use of AI is to make us smarter, right? So you have artificial intelligence, it should make humans smarter. So this new project, it's in its infancy. We're calling it the Aris Project, short for Aristotle. Um, but the idea is to have a, a, a fully AI-based education platform that starts as young as maybe like six months old. You know, my son is four years old now, and, but when he was six months old, he could go to the iPad, swipe it to unlock, you know, find the thing that he wants to, a little puzzle game, and then start to learn from it. Incredible. And so if, if AI can power that, while it's teaching a, a child, it's also learning how the best way to teach that child. Right. And it just gets better and better and better. And if, if we can do that, then you can expand the curriculum to anything, K through 12 and beyond, languages, whatever, it doesn't matter. And then if you can truly give that away for free, meaning we're not going to mine data, we're not going to sell data, we're not going to show ads, uh, nothing, right? Just really give it away. Then we, one, we change what world-class education means, which we don't even know what that limit is. And then beyond that, now the a kid who's born in the worst neighborhood of Chicago or born in the slums of Delhi will now have the, if you can get a device in their hand, you can give them the same world-class education as the most privileged child in Beverly Hills. Incredible. Wow. That is such, such a noble thought. <laughs> Incredible. I think everybody up here in their own right, I just talked to you guys about group. I want to get singular now about individually how you think. So when you're thinking about moving to next moves, the future, how do you do that individually? Is it mind mapping? Is it strategy charts? What role does all of this play and how do you get there? So I'm going to open this up to the panel, but Waz, I'm going to start with you, one of our great well, innovators. Yeah, my, my position is a little different than a lot of people. I never go out to try to promote myself or seek Things I kind of they kind of a lot of things roll my way and I pick and choose. Oh my gosh, I, this is so interesting. I want to learn more about it. I want to read about it. I want to get into it. My life actually got distracted for a long time because of Apple's success. I would follow all of the apps and all of the new smartphone innovations and stuff like that. And now I'm getting more interested in electrical vehicles and self-driving and and whatnot. But you know the thing is, I was following all that stuff. And I got distracted from who I was sitting down as just a developer putting a few pieces together and starting to write my own code and learning things and struggling and struggling to get things working for night after night after night and then so relieved when it finally works and feeling so proud and <laughs> the amount of time went into it. So I'm actually trying to go back to that, that person at this point in my life, you know, a hobby when I get the time aside from traveling and touring and speaking a lot. Was what world is, what do instincts play in all of this? What, what, say what role do instincts play what in all this? What role do instincts play yes. in all this? Um, instincts are extremely important. I believe, I kind of grew up, well, of course, I was a very left brain, you might say, a very careful working with structured systems to develop hardware and software. And now, boy, Apple sure took me in a different direction of thinking. This really, what do you feel as a human being? 
is worth a, you know, a lot more. I almost want to do everything I can without going through the structure. I do not want to learn where to tap real efficiently and quickly to get things done on my iPhone. I just want to pick it up while well, my watch, and I just want to speak into the watch and have things answered and get questions to things and send message, quick messages to, to my wife and whatever. And I just want to do it because you don't really have to memorize and think about a procedure. When we were moving Apple towards the Macintosh, towards the mouse-based computer, oh my gosh, the, the Microsoft computers were DOS. You had to memorize long lines to get things done with files on a computer. And all of a sudden, with a mouse, you just look with your eyes and drag things like a human being does. And that meant so much. You don't have to memorize all this stuff. We came out with the Newton Message Pad once at Apple. It was a tablet that you could handwrite with your own human muscles. I believe so much in the human and everything in technology should be most important. Your human muscles, you could write words and it would know what the words were that you had just written. And the first day I had my Newton message pad, San Francisco airport, about to fly my kids to Disney World, and I got a phone call, and I just learned that I could write words on the notepad of the Newton, and I, got a, I wrote a, a reminder message to myself. <laughs> just a reminder, Sarah, dentist, Tuesday, 2 p.m. And then I saw, I'm looking around, oh, there's a menu called assist or something. I clicked assist, it opened up the calendar by surprise to me. On Tuesday at 2 p.m., it put the word dentist, and it let me pick Sarah out of my contact list, and I was, it changed my life forever. <laughs> I said, I want to live in the human totally. world, writing or speaking totally. the human way, and have machines understand me. And so even on that Newton message pad, of course, I would take all my notes in classes, meaning driver improvement classes, I would take all my notes on the message pad, and I would, and if I wanted oh, to please. call my friend Jim, I would handwrite, C-A-L-L, Jim, call Jim, and hit assist, beep, 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 beep. And I didn't have to go through the structure of typing, you know, 353 on the telephone. And uh, that was a big life change, just like Siri was later on, you know, before Apple had Siri. It was a third-party app for a year. What's changed my life the most of Apple products, the third-party app store, to let tens, hundreds of thousands and millions of smart people come up with their own solutions to life. Y'all, we just Thank heard Steve so Wozniak's <laughs> aha moment. Incredible. Does anyone else want to take us through their, like, yeah. yes? OK, sure. great. Matt, Matt yeah, bring it. I, you know, God, I hate little scraps of paper. <laughs> I really, I really hate little scraps of paper. And, and I, I would not be able to live my life and do what I do without a calendar uh, and, and reminders. <laughs> that go with the calendar and, and, and a contact list. Like these, to me, these are basic functions that I need to rely on um, to, to, to get through my day. So I just want to say thank you. And, and, and this idea of, of, of a visual interface. We might have gone down a totally different path if it weren't for you. Absolutely. And, no, really. I, I, I really use, appreciate Use that. Apple's calendar and Google won't know every place I, you go. I, 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 went, <laughs> I, I went the wrong way. So when I, was, a month. when I was 14, unfortunately, I couldn't afford an Apple. So I was a Commodore kid, right? And we had 64K of memory, right? Like it was a big deal. And, and, and for me, you know, I, so I was, you know, hacking on, on that thing. Um, but... But once just these few key utilities came along, mm. right? Mm. And, and, and now we're thinking about, well, what are the, what are the next few key utilities that are going to come along, right? And so, so for us, you know, I hear people, you know, so I, I deal with people who are doing food tech all the time, right? I'm in the food tech space constantly. And I hear people say, oh, we're going to save you time in the kitchen, like, what are you saving your time for? <laughs> you're going to just so you can spend more time on your screen? Really? Like, is that a real thing? You want to go back to the screen? No. Because your time in the kitchen, man, that's quality. You, you know, we know, I mean, there's study after study after study. You spend time with your kids in the kitchen. They, they eat better. They, they do better in school, right? Like, so, so my emphasis is how do we help people become better individuals and how do we help people have better interactions with each other and and and, and for me I'm biased 
it happens around food and drink. There you go. Yeah. It's awesome. Tony, I think you had something to add to this in your process. Sure. Yeah, you know, um, it's funny when you asked me that. It's, uh, I, I don't, I sort of know what a mind map is, right. but I, I don't do any of that. It's, um, when I think about what the next big thing is or what we're going to go chase, it's very much by happenstance and really looking for opportunities. And sometimes it's, um, I think, finding things that other people think are impossible. Mm -hmm. And I would say there's so many things that have not been done or have not been tried only because they haven't been tried by other people. Right. Which is a weird thing, right? Um, and sometimes things are not tried because somebody tried once and failed. Mm. Somebody had to try to climb Mount Everest before that was a thing. <laughs> so I think we just pick unreasonable, impossible goals, and then nice. that's sort of what we are. I mean, you know, lottery.com. It's just, I don't, you know, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> grow up dreaming <laughs> of, like, selling lottery tickets, right? <laughs> um, but we kind of found ourselves in this position, and um, now all of a sudden we can actually be this global impact company right. that can solve some of the UN's SDGs, whether that's, you know, through education or that's through um, ending extreme hunger. And so I just say, just set the goal, like I said about leaders. And don't stop. And go. Just keep Figure going. It out. I Be like so that. stupid and stubborn that you make it happen. Perfect. For you. Molly, I love this question for you when it comes to instincts, because you leaned on yours heavily. <laughs> um, yeah, and they always, they haven't always been good. <laughs> um, but, you know, in, in terms of instincts and in terms of uh, planning for the future, there's, there's a couple takeaways that I use from my sports background to kind of address this. Like, I think the future is impossible to predict. I certainly could not have predicted my path, but I think it's really important to do the preparation in the present. And I learned that from sports, and I think that that looks like, um, you know, m mind, body, spirit. And so for me, meditation practice is huge. That allows me to rely on my instincts, but to see what's instinct and what's not. Yeah. You know, to, to, to get through that muddiness of what is the fiction that I'm creating and, and what's the truth. So um, meditation is huge practice for me. Um, and and just, just staying present and staying healthy in the moment. And then it's much easier for me to see what's actual instinct and what's maybe impulse. Yeah. It's incredible. You can't take the athlete out of someone. Mm -hmm. Tone, bring us home, brother. Come on. Um, so for me, it's... Um, it's a little bit different. It's actually kind of the opposite because I've only built my reputation in the last few years uh, because of technology. I started out as a geology major and I was, I was finishing that degree. I realized I don't really want to be like in the field and I wasn't very good at staring at a rock cliff figuring out where it came from. Uh, wasn't my thing. I became a high school te math teacher. I did that for a year. I didn't like it. Went and got a master's in financial engineering. I was a college professor for a little bit while I learned SQL skills and VBA skills and better Excel skills. My first job was at Bear Stearns about a year and a half before the collapse. Uh, that was interesting. <laughs> Spent uh, about 10 years on Wall Street, and then I got tired of that and uh, joined uh, the Bitcoin world, wanted to be a trader, slowly became a YouTuber. Now I'm a content creator, and I'm back to my teaching background, an educational background. And because of technology, I can do what I do on my YouTube channel for free for people around the world and educate them. And that technology did not exist when I started, pretty much, uh, becoming a teacher. And now I'm just doing it in something that I'm really, really passionate about. And uh, I'll continue to try and educate people on Bitcoin, on blockchain, and be responsible traders, which is another thing I cover a lot on my YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, my YouTube and online reputation was just built in the last few years. Incredible. I hope Great. someone's taking notes for me out there. So <laughs> every one of these is fantastic. So, Sean, I'm going to turn over the next question to you. Sweet. Here I you go. Think of something. Serve you All right. up. So I, something's on my mind. And I'm going to bring together a couple of things from conversations and comments earlier. Was you and I touched a little bit on the singularity, you know, open AI. And there's this huge debate on really where things are going to go. And, and I think I have the same, you know, flip back and forth with you do. Because I see things, you know, as an investor that blow my mind. And then I see the simple state of things that really blow my mind on how bad they are. But it's irrefutable that technology is moving forward at an accelerating pace. Tony. You know, when we were talking about AI, you know, there was a comment that came up that's essentially, you know, these are tools that enable us not to replace us, right? And that's the big fear of this debate around the singularity. So I want to open to the panel. And, and Waz, I'd like to start with you on this one. You know, as we see this irrefutable acceleration of technology, adoption, creation, 
what is our role as an individual to try and moderate or help and assist that? Or frankly, is it just completely out of our hands at this point? It's hard to answer because I think it's mostly out of our hands and we can't stop, you know, one element of learning, figuring out something, figuring out how to do something, a new type of product, a technology, a new type of atomic material that got found and created. We can't stop people from searching, trying to find new things, new ways. What is the future? And uh, it's very hard to slow it down. And could it go in disappointing directions? Of course it could. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it moves so fast, but how can you predict? And when I worked at Apple, I could predict what was going to happen in the next year, because I was working on it. And what was going to happen two years later? I'd make my guesses, and I'd always be wrong. <laughs> so many other people would have different ideas and come up with different things would be valuable by two years ahead. And yes, you know, try to think 10 years ahead and whatnot. Um, as far as, you know, technology and singularity, I'm not too afraid of it. I've gone back and forth and up and down for different reasons, thinking about the, the real fundamental aspects of it. And it's kind of like we don't have any machines to sit down and say, hmm, what should I do today? What would be a good project? What would be interesting to do? So everything that we're creating today, even if we call it artificial intelligence, is really coming from humans. Every, every machine learning is an example that we said, you run this program, you will learn on your own. We don't know where you're going to go with it, but you're going to learn something we directed you to learn. You'll be good at it, and it will help us humans um, better. But we don't really have machines that do real type of creative, intuitive thinking that humans do. Uh, are we getting close to it? You know, are machines ever going to totally run the world, um, you know, and do everything that's, that's physical and mechanical? Ha <laughs> ha. Think about the infrastructure of the world from the machines that dig ores in the ground and bringing it up and transport it and process it and materials and, and hundreds of places it all gets transported and becomes chips and becomes... That, you're talking such a huge infrastructure, it would take hundreds of years for, for, uh, for that to happen. And there'd have to be still some master machine that says, oh, I want to, I want something. I want to run the world over humans. So really, I, I think that we're just going to create things <laughs> that supposedly help us. You know, and of course, yeah, if we create, you know, we trade weaponry that will make some choices on it, our own. It's, I'm sorry, it's done by humans, not by machines. Thanks, Waz. Tone, I, I think I know where you're going to go with this one, but I mean, Bitcoin, cat's out of the bag. It's, just, it's, it's unstoppable. What do you think? Yeah, no, I'm not scared of technology at all. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I am looking forward to uh, more AI tools. I mean, at the end of the day, AI is just a computer program that someone programmed. And uh, they can always program another one and a better one. And I'm not scared of that. I'm not scared of machines taking over the world. Uh, but people do need to be prepared because machines are coming for your jobs. Uh, no matter what your field is, unless you are uh, uh, like an entertainer, um, other than that, if you have any kind of a, a job, like if you also learn computer programming, uh, you can then do so much more with that job. Pretty much everything is going to get automated. And uh, that is going to be a huge paradigm shift for people. And people will have to get used to it. But I'm not scared of that at all. I'm looking forward to it. I wish it came faster. <laughs> like There's so many things that I, uh, I, I, I want to I see already. I certainly want to see self-driving cars by now. Certainly want to see better energy solutions by now. And uh, technology is getting there. It's getting there slowly. And um, I think, uh, again, going back to Bitcoin and blockchain for a minute, um, I, I do think it could help a little bit is that um, as an amazing book, The Bitcoin Standard, talked about um, like the time preference of money, uh, being able to save your money in something that's not going to depreciate and will probably appreciate will allow people to save to build something great. And uh, that's, uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. And now there is an exit. And everyone is worried about financial crisis in the fiat system. And now there is an alternative that could help that transition. And you're not going to have this monster depression uh, that I'm hoping we can avoid economically in order to continue building amazing technology. It's a great answer, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Matt, I want to bring it down to you to some of the conversation we had. You, know, you, you take a, a, a very hands-on and human approach leveraging technology to do this stuff. Where do you come out on this? Um, well, I really think, you know, I, I had a slide about singularity, right? And I, I said uh, the singularity will happen through food, right? And it's something that, uh, that our friend Ray, who came up with the coin, the phrase singularity, you know, he didn't think about food at all, right? 
And in fact, you know, I was telling you a story uh, in the green room about, you know, medicine. And um, I don't know, do I, do I don't have time for that right now, do I? Uh, <laughs> well, anyway. Right, so this will be, if you get a chance, pull Matt aside while you're having right. a cocktail at the bar, because this, this is the, a the, fascinating the, story. The, 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 okay, the, the, I'll, I'll, I'll shorten it, I'll shorten it. Okay, you got music setting up behind you, I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Oh, okay, no problem. So, <laughs> we have to ask ourselves what we're going to do with the singularity. What's good about it, right? Do we want to do we want to make people better through drugs and and surgery and radiation and fix them after problems have gone wrong, or do we want to help guide people towards a better planet and better health and and a better living? Yeah. And and if we can get that right, then we can get the singularity right. Yes. And that's what I meant when I said. You know, um, but c because we haven't done that right so far, we've invested all of our money into 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 this medical system instead of a health system, and we need to we need to shift as humanity. We need to shift. I had no idea you were going to talk about the UN Sustainability Development Goals. That just warms my heart. <laughs> no, <laughs> me too. Really, that, that makes me so happy. I, like the lottery guy is talking about sustainability development goals. I had no idea, and it just it's so. Awesome. Yeah, it's totally awesome. All right. And, and, and so, yeah, my 60 seconds. That, I, hate it. So, so I, I, I hate to do this. So we have time for one last question. And you guys have certainly heard enough of my voice for the last three days. <laughs> so I'm going to give it to my much better half as a moderating team, Denise. Take us home. So we've spent three days talking about technology, talking about human influence, talking about how impact makes such a dramatic change on our future. The theme of this entire symposium for the past three days has been, how will you change tomorrow? So I'm very curious to each one of you. Waz, how will you change tomorrow? Well, oh, I, I, I think about the uh, most important things to me aren't what you normally call achievement. I don't even like to, to meet well achieved and established and people have done important things. I like to meet interesting people, the sort of people they make movies about. Um, but to me, from growing up, I figured out when I was 20 years old, really, who I was in life, and I stuck to a lot of things people wouldn't. I went back and got a degree I would have gotten without Apple. I went and taught fifth grade, which I would have done without Apple and wanted to do. I knew who I was inside, but my formula was for happiness is the most important thing in life. Not how much you achieve, not how much you get. It's how happy you are. And I think Great back, where yes. are we? Yes. 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 Oh, come on, you guys. More than that. More than yes. that. I love your equation. With, with, all our, with all the things that we have in our life that make things easy, are we really happier than people were 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, cavemen days? They were probably just as happy. There's probably just some proportion of humanness that really yes. doesn't change with time. But we think we're going to get to that world where we're happy all the time if we create all these devices. Anyway, I made up my formula, and it was humanness. Feelings is what happiness is about. And so my formula was H equals S minus F. Happiness equals smiles minus frowns. <laughs> Do the things that make you smile. You know, go to, go to events like this. Go to movies. Uh, um, go to concerts. You know, uh, play jokes and pranks. And how do you avoid frowns? And I came up with formulas in my own life that worked very well. Don't argue. If somebody disagrees with, has a different way of thinking, they have their way of thinking, I have my way of thinking, we're both good people. Um, if my car gets scratched, fix it. You don't, don't, don't get all, don't get up, don't let things get you upset. It's sort of a not caring thing. I modified my formula in a little later years to include entertainment after I put on some huge rock concerts in Southern California. A million tickets sold each of the years, 82 and 83. And I changed my formula um, to include the fun element more and I said H equals F cubed. Happiness equals food, which is the necessities of life. Food, fun, and friends. Are oh my God. But I was, getting, <laughs> I was getting inducted into my high school hall of fame, and I gave that formula out, and the students started laughing, and I had to embarrassingly admit, well, there might be a fourth F. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to run out of time for this. Just drop it right now. Just yeah. drop the bike. <laughs> you picked that one up pretty well. How are you changing tomorrow? Uh, Besides taking uh, Waz's direct quote, and uh, we're getting both getting tattoos. Okay, well, the, 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 I guess the first way I'll change tomorrow, take off my clothes. 
<laughs> All right, that was bad, that was bad. The first way I will change tomorrow, I hope, is to, to, to find out more about Waz's formula. And I mean, it's, it's resonating, seriously. And, um, and to understand how can we compute over that? How can, we, how can we compute over happiness, right? If you look at the DSM, the, the Diagnostic Services Manual, this is for psychologists and psychiatrists. We've got something on the order of like 2,000 different ways to describe depression. Depression, feeling bad depression, not like you got hit in the head with a, and you got a concave skull <laughs> depression, but like depression, like I'm depressed, I'm feeling bad, right? Post-traumatic depression, all kinds of depression, right? We've got like, I think it's like 20 words to describe happiness in the medical vocabulary, right? And like, I don't know, I don't remember the numbers exactly, so don't quote me, but it's, I'm, I know I'm close. Like, more than 75% of them are related to unhappiness, mm. right? We've been focused in the wrong direction. So, my change tomorrow is going to be, how do we compute over happiness? Yes. How do we compute over joy and delight and making the world a better place? Yes. Tone. How are you changing tomorrow? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, let's give that up. That was amazing. Uh, I absolutely agree. Uh, I, I'm going to try to take it in a different direction because um, everything amazing has been said about happiness and enjoying your life. And you certainly want to do, especially for a living, whatever earns you money, you want to do something you love. Uh, but I'm going to change that back to technology. And uh, I've spoken to a few early people in the early days of the internet. And the one thing they really regretted is putting encryption and privacy into the internet. Mm -hmm. And I think that if I had the ability to change tomorrow, I would uh, hope that all of our social media apps, more of our communication is just encryption wasn't frowned upon. And the people that are building all of this technology, you don't need decentralization. Decentralization is usually inefficient. All it takes is the right person at the top of a company, the right CEO, to believe in people's privacy and provide them encryption uh, so that uh, others that want to do you harm can't just uh, watch everything you do and spy all over you like the book 1984. And I think that's what people can do today and what they could have done for the last 10 years. And I'm disappointed that it still isn't happening to that degree. Uh, Bitcoin does that intuitively, but Bitcoin had to be decentralized. But our communication uh, doesn't have to be decentralized. We just need the right people to believe in privacy uh, for us. And I think that would go a long way uh, to helping society. Thank you, Tone. Welcome. We're being asked to wrap it up, but I'm not letting you guys off. Molly, how are you changing tomorrow? As quickly as we can so they don't <laughs> literally yank us off the stage. <laughs> In my previous life, I was um, able to create transformational experiences for rich people in the context of gambling. And I was really successful at it, but it wasn't really that interesting. So I'm really committed right now to creating programs, conferences, um, different sort of localized uh, meetups to create transformational experiences for people who are kind of in helpless, hopeless situations. And then I hope to use uh, technology to scale. Nice. Tony? Thank you, Molly. Bring us home. How are you changing tomorrow? Um, thank you. So I hope in two ways. I think one is we have a very special opportunity um, to really end extreme hunger in the world. It's not that far away. And it's, yes. a, it's one of the SDGs. And it, it's actually, we can accomplish it. So I hope with enough people out there and, and my team that we can do that. Because if, if, if you can't eat and you have no food in your stomach, you can't think, you can't learn. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing more is sure. than scarcity. Yeah. It's terrible. It is. And then the next thing is I hope through the ARIS project that we can actually democratize all education and get devices into hands of everyone. And if you just, there's so many applications here, but if you think about how many Einstein level IQs are just born in the wrong place and time, you know, in the slums of Delhi, or they just never get a chance, they end up digging ditches. The world has missed out on all of that. And I think we don't know what's gonna happen with AI and what, you know, maybe there's some negative things that happen there, but what we do know we can do is actually have AI make us more intelligent find those special gifted minds and that kind of elevate them. Incredible. Can you join me with Shahi and just say this burst of positivity and say thank you to this incredible panel? CXC, it's that time. Woo! First, a big round of applause.